Today, we're going to be covering vascular ultrasound, focusing on DVT and aortic imaging. The technique for this is really quite straightforward, particularly for people who regularly use advanced echo. So hopefully it will just be a quick and efficient review of some of the anatomy that might be covered in the exam. I was going to include Vexus in this lecture, but given how interested people seem to be in this at the moment, I'll think I'll cover it in a separate talk. So let's start with DVT. I probably don't need to say this, but DVTs are common, particularly in our patient population. Typically in focused scanning, we can use a quick three point compression scan, but this can be extended proximally or distally if needed. Color ultrasound is useful, particularly as very acute thrombus is extremely hypoechoic and may not be easily visible. Scans we perform are going to be rule in rather than rule out. And for the most part, we'll be using the high frequency linear probe. In some patients though, you may need to use a virtual convex mode to gain a little bit more depth or switch to the curvilinear probe. Differentiating veins from arteries is probably something that seems extremely straightforward for intensivists, but reliance on compression is not always going to be foolproof. Remember, veins can also be pulsatile and in severe hypovolemia, the artery can also be easily compressed. Veins tend to be more oval in contrast with thin walls and are easy to compress. Arteries by contrast, tend to have a consistently round shape with thicker, hyperechoic walls and are less easy to compress. Whilst arteries are more pulsatile, remember that there can be special scenarios where the vein may be more pulsatile, such as with ventricular assist devices. Small print, but worth remembering. Compression is a technique used to ensure wall-to-wall -wall opposition of the vein and is shown here in the video of the internal jugular vein. Compression ultrasound for DVT is performed by delivering downward pressure at one to two centimeter intervals as the venous system is followed. This is shown here in the lower limb venous system. Enough downward pressure should be applied to cause wall to wall opposition of the vein, but not completely compress the artery. If a clot is present, it's usually seen as a slightly hyperechoic structure, causing a filling defect within the vein and preventing that wall to wall opposition. In very acute thrombus, it may not be echogenic enough to visualize, therefore relying on compression ultrasound and color filling defects is important. Three point scanning is a quick technique to identify the points where the majority of the thrombus is formed. Scanning begins at the common femoral vein at the junction with the great saphenous vein. From here, the probe is moved inferiorly into the adductor canal where the superficial femoral vein lies underneath the femoral artery. The last point is the popliteal fossa, where the popliteal vein and trifurcation are identified. Whilst this is a brief scan, it can be extended to see the regions in between. The femoral vein is seen adjacent to the femoral artery at the level of the inguinal ligament. This is a view that many of you I'm sure are familiar with from central line insertion. As this is followed inferiorly, the junction between the common femoral vein and saphenous vein can be seen. This is known as the saphenofemoral junction and is point one of the three point scan. This image shows the before and after of compression ultrasound. The anatomy at this point is commonly referred to as a Mickey Mouse sign with Mickey's face representing the common femoral vein and the ears the common femoral artery in the saphenous vein. Sliding the transducer down shows the bifurcation of the femoral vein the superficial vein should then be followed into the adductor canal until it's no longer visible. In the adductor canal, the femur does not underlie the vessels, so the non-scanning hand may need to be held underneath the medial aspect of the thigh to allow compression. Lastly, the popliteal vein should be seen superficially to the popliteal artery in the popliteal fossa. The vein should be followed upwards until it's no longer seen and downwards until the popliteal trifurcation. This image here shows a trifurcation of the popliteal vein. DVTs are seen either as a filling defect or an echogenic, often mobile structure within the vein. This is an example of a DVT within the common femoral vein seen in both short and long axes. These are both examples of thrombus within the superficial femoral vein and the popliteal vein. Scanning this region has the potential to miss thrombus both proximal and distal to the flow of blood. Certain additional tests can be used to predict the risk of thrombus more peripheral than the popliteal trifurcation 
or more central than the femoral vein. The first of these is respiratory phasicity. The deep venous system is in continuity with the heart and therefore is subject to variation in flow velocity. Most of you are very familiar with this when assessing the hepatic vein in venous congestion or tricuspid regurgitation. By placing pulse wave Doppler within the femoral vein, a phasic flow can be seen. If there is a thrombus downstream, such as in the ILAX or the IBC, the cardiac flow characteristics are not transmitted, causing a significant reduction in the flow variation as is seen on the image on the right. The second additional technique to consider is flow augmentation. If the peripheral musculature is compressed, such as a calf, then there should be a resulting spike in the popliteal or femoral venous flow due to increased venous return. If the vessels distal to the probe are obstructed, there will be no significant flow augmentation. This is obviously quite a tricky thing to do, um, particularly while simultaneously scanning, and so is slightly losing popularity. We often don't really consider upper limb DVTs, but they can make up about 10% of the total DVTs in our patients, a figure that's probably underestimated, particularly in our population. Due to the sternum and intrathoracic vessels, they can be much more difficult to assess, and imaging tends to rely more heavily on the respiratory phasicity and the flow augmentation to identify any clots. The first point will be very familiar to everyone, imaging the internal jugular vein. As you follow this down into the thorax, a junction between the internal jugular, subclavian vein, and brachycephalic vein can be seen. You often need to shine the ultrasound beam into the thorax by sliding all the way down to the clavicle and tilting the tail of the probe towards you. This is also quite a handy view for making sure your central line wire is going towards the heart, rather than sneaking into the subclavian or IJ, depending on your insertion location. Here you can see a wire passing from the subclavian vein into the brachycephalic vein. In the infraclavicular region, the axillary vein can be seen passing underneath the clavicle. This is also potentially a good in-plane view for infraclavicular subclavian or axillary cannulation. The axillary vein can be followed into the axilla and then seen to divide into the basilic and brachial veins. And here you can see the paired brachial veins in the middle with the brachial artery. It's important to try and compress sequentially along this system, but clearly there are some areas where this is not possible. You've just got to try your best and remember that most of the areas affected are going to be where we do vascular access. Now we'll move on to imaging the abdominal aorta, which is important to try and identify aneurysms in causes of undifferentiated shock in patients presenting to the ED. Knowing the anatomy, particularly of key branches, helps differentiate it from the IVC, which is a surprisingly common mistake. Generally, it's a fairly straightforward assessment, but this is limited by the usual abdominal ultrasound factors such as body habitus and bowel gas. It's imaged using the low-frequency curvilinear probe, but the phased array or a microconvex can also be used. The abdominal aorta is a retroperitoneal structure, originating as a continuation of the descending thoracic aorta of the diaphragm and runs parallel to the IVC. It lies anterior to the vertebral bodies until its bifurcation into the common iliacs at around L4. The key branches seen with ultrasound are the celiac axis, SMA and the bifurcation. Really, a POCUS study should be able to follow the entire course and recognise and record these landmarks. As mentioned, the key thing that you're looking for is an aneurysm, but dissection can also sometimes be seen. Imaging should start at the epigastrium in both the transverse and sagittal views. The aorta can be seen overlying the vertebral bodies labeled as SP in this image, and the celiac axis is seen anteriorly branching into the hepatic and splenic arteries. The IVC can also be seen to the left of the screen, and as usual, the liver is a dominant landmark. Tracking distally will reveal the superior mesenteric artery superficial to the aorta. Other key structures here are the splenic vein, portal vein, IVC and the liver. Given that 90-95% to 95 of AAAs are in the infrarenal aorta, the region distal to the SMA really shouldn't be neglected. The iliacs can be visualised but normally don't form part of a focus study. As mentioned, it's important to try and do both transverse and sagittal views of the aorta, and here you can see the key branches in a sagittal view. 
The right or left flank can be used as an alternative imaging window if bowel gas or just a generally poorly prepared patient is obscuring the conventional midline. This might be particularly useful if the uh, midline is obscured due to surgical dressings. An aneurysm is a focal dilatation of a blood vessel that measures over three centimeters in diameter, with the most common type being a fusiform aneurysm. Saccular aneurysms can also happen and are asymmetrical localized dilatations, which form a sac-like swelling. These are much more common, usually following trauma to the vessel. Ultrasound is very good at recognizing the presence of an aneurysm, but poor, have poor sensitivity for identifying a rupture or a leak, which is often retroperitoneal. So generally, if you see an aneurysm in someone with a consistent history and shock, an urgent CT should be the imaging of choice. The image on the left shows a very large AAA of 10.5 centimeters. Calipers are used to measure the AP dimension as shown here. In the image on the right, the aorta may be mistakenly considered to be normal in diameter um, due to the presence of a mural thrombus. Uh, the correct method for measurement is from outer edge to outer edge of the vessel. Occasionally, ultrasound may reveal an intimal flap that can be seen in the aorta just here. Ultrasound obviously has quite poor sensitivity for this and contrast CT is the imaging method of choice, but just be aware that you may get incidental findings. Remember that if you see a dissection to perform an urgent echo to see if there's any complications associated with a type A dissection. As is seen here, there is a type A dissection with a dissection flap in the ascending aorta with associated aortic regurgitation and pericardial effusion. Thanks very much for listening. If you have any questions about this or related topics, then please don't hesitate to contact me.